Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hi, my name is Bob. I'm one of the pastors here at The Meeting Place. Hello. I'm so excited to be here this morning and to share with you some words that Jesus spoke to his followers uh, some time ago. If you're a person who has decided to follow Jesus, then I hope that you will be encouraged by these words, perhaps be re-inspired, reignited in your faith. And for those of you that are here or online this morning, perhaps curious about who Jesus is and maybe considering what a relationship with him would look like, I hope that you will discover some things to be true of him that will cause you to consider, to seriously consider to becoming a follower of Jesus. Here's the interesting thing. Jesus is unique in this, and that is that everything that he ever said actually came to be. He's a person we can trust because it turned out 100% of the time. So when we look at his statements, when we look at his declarations, we are aware that he's speaking a truth that we so hunger for in our life. So I want to pose a question to you, but let me set you up first so that you understand the premise of the question. Think about a time, perhaps it's recent, perhaps it's some time ago, when you were in need of something. Perhaps you needed a friend to spend some time with you. Maybe you were in need of food or shelter or something, like a physical thing that you needed that someone else needed to provide for you. Or perhaps you were in a place where you were experiencing relational difficulties and you realized that you had harmed a relationship. You had hurt someone, you had dishonored someone, and now you were in need of forgiveness. And so you're in this conversation with them, you understand that this is true of you, you understand that you can't deny it, you can't explain it away, you can't defend it, you just simply have to say, I am sorry, could you please make this right with me? And in that moment, whether you receive the physical thing or whether you receive these words of affirmation, you will have received from that person mercy. What did it feel like to receive mercy? Jesus has invited his followers to a mountainside retreat. We don't know how much time he spent there with them, but he removed himself and his followers away from the large public settings where there were always crowds that gathered, people that came to see him because they wanted to hear what it is that he had to say. This is one of those moments, as Matthew chapter 5 illustrates for us, where he takes his followers, his disciples, and he takes them to this away location, and they sit down together, and he begins to teach them. And he says a number of very powerful things. And today we're looking at two of the statements that, he's, that he offers. The first one is this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I don't know if it's happening for you. I know what happens for me. When I read words that Jesus speaks in Scripture, I often find myself reflecting for a moment and saying, okay, is, it, is what I'm reading, is this true of me? So perhaps you're wondering, am I in fact a merciful person? And so you can imagine that this would have been a question that would have occurred to the disciples who are sitting there with Jesus, who are listening to him, make this declaration. They ask themselves this question, am I in fact a merciful person? The statements that Jesus issues in this particular setting to the disciples in this moment, they follow this interesting pattern. There's always the start with the word blessed. There are lots of things we've said about it as we've explored this series so far. Today, I just want to introduce perhaps a simple concept and a way for us to understand it. It could have started by saying, congratulations, congratulations. And then there's an action step, a specific thing that's required, blessed 
congratulations, are the merciful. So in other words, be merciful. This is something that you should consider. And then there's an outcome, a result if you want, and maybe a promise. And the promise today is, for they will be shown mercy. I love these statements. And so as we explore whether or not this applies to us, consider the disciples and consider the world that they lived in. So there's a couple of things that are true about what they experienced. Number one, we know that at the time, the Roman Empire had come along and had conquered their nation. So these disciples who are part of the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, are sitting there with Jesus, and while they're there, they're constantly aware of the reality of a Roman Empire. Now, the Romans had a lot of reputation, but one of the parts that was not part of their reputation was mercy. This was something that people didn't experience with them. And in fact, every time they glimpsed a soldier or noticed that there was an authority who was speaking and once again just enforcing this imposition of the Roman Empire on their nation, they would not have heard words of mercy. They would not have heard words that were comforting. Rather, they would have lived under the constant threat of being vulnerable, perhaps to come to harm because of the oppressor of the day. So imagine Jesus speaking these words out to say, Blessed are the merciful. I imagine it would have been difficult for them to imagine that this is something that would, was possible, for them to be merciful in a world that seemed very hostile to them. And there's a second part to this. You see, the um, Hebrew disciples were also part of a people of God. They were chosen by him very deliberately. In their past, their great prophet Moses had received from God the Ten Commandments. And as soon as these Ten Commandments arrived, and these were instructions that helped this nation to understand what kind of people they were to be. It helped them to organize themselves as far as how they would relate to one another. But in addition to that, it also created for them an understanding as to what would please God, what would give him pleasure, the things that were important to him. And so again, these disciples of Jesus would have lived under the demandments, if you, the, the, the demands of the commandments, of these Ten Commandments. And no sooner did the Ten Commandments arrive than those who were sort of, you know, had this leaning. They started interpreting what the Ten Commandments actually meant. And they spent time flushing out specific instructions to actually organize life and the culture around these Ten Commandments because these they had received directly from God. In the process of doing so, they lost the fact that God himself was a merciful God, that he was a kind and gracious God because it suddenly became all about the rules. One of the Ten Commandments, just to give you an example of this, is the Ten Commandment which says this, remember the Sabbath and honor it, which essentially meant you and your family, and perhaps if you had servants, you were allowed to work six days a week. But on the seventh day, the instructions were, you are to rest. No one is allowed to do any work. Well, it's a wonderful commandment. I think we would appreciate it, the fact that there are these rhythms of rest. However, interestingly enough, you're now left with this interesting question. What, in fact, constitutes work? So what can you do on the Sabbath, and what aren't you allowed to do on the Sabbath? Because work is sort of a, well, it's not a very clear category. And so sure enough, people who were determined to interpret this to the very best of their ability, created a minutia of laws that surrounded the practices of honoring the Sabbath. So for example, if you were a homemaker, you were essentially burdened with the responsibility of starting the fire in your home, at the hearth of your home, just before sundown of the Sabbath, because until sundown at the end of the Sabbath, you were not allowed to add any more fuel, any more wood to the fire, because that was considered work. So you had to prepare yourself in advance that this would in fact provide the heat that you needed for the course of the Sabbath day. I experienced this myself. As a middle school student, my family, uh, we went to Israel to experience one of those tours to, you know, see the lands and the places where Jesus traveled. And on the Sabbath, we found something very interesting. I don't know what floor we were in our hotel, but the interesting thing that happened is we stepped into the elevator, and the elevator, as it proceeded down to the lobby, stopped at every floor. The doors opened up, and people came in or left, and then the, floor, and then the elevator continued to descend down to the lobby. 
You see, the interpretation of honoring the Sabbath had meant that someone had cooked this up or had thought about this, that perhaps pushing the elevator button constituted work on the Sabbath. And so that couldn't happen, so they made this arrangement. This left a profound impact on me because I sort of, I was reminded of the fact that there was this people who lived under these kinds of restrictions and the disciples would have felt the weight of that. They would have understood that they were living in an environment where virtually every move that they would make, every part of their life was in some ways directed and guided and there was, they were subject to scrutiny. And sure enough, there are those amongst them, the Pharisees, who became so committed to these laws and rules that they made it their business to observe everyone else and to pass judgment on whether or not they were in fact keeping all these rules. And in all of that process, mercy went out the window, got lost. So now Jesus stands up in front of them and says, blessed are the merciful. This is risky stuff. This requires a great deal of courage. And they weren't sure if this was actually something that they could be about. But I love the statement, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I love the direct correlation of these two things. And I don't know about you, but it raised in my mind, who goes first? Right? If there is this relationship between being merciful and then be shown mercy, who goes first? This is risky stuff. Carolyn alluded to this in her prayer based on Psalm 51. We live in a world, you and I, that is not so different from the world of the disciples. Or they didn't have elevators in their day, but there are lots of things that are still true of humanity. As you're watching the news, we're confronted by the fact that we're living in a time where there are many people who've decided enough is enough. There are things that are coming to the surface. There's truth telling that's going on that's coming to the surface. And there are responses and there are factions. There's there are divisions. There are people who are taking positions. There are people who are making public declarations. There are people marching in the streets. And I watch this news as you watch the news. And I ask myself the question, where is the right and wrong in this? I don't know who I should align with. I don't know where our participation as faith communities lies in all of this. And as I observe this, I'm aware that themes of justice, themes of accountability, themes of the truth-telling that's required, these are all good things that we would celebrate, and yet at the same time, I also see themes of revenge. I see themes of judgment. I see themes that lack love and grace. I see that in some ways, the divisions are just getting larger all the time. And it occurs to me, perhaps it occurs to you, that the difference, what difference mercy could make in these circumstances? What if we introduced mercy into the midst of this, where people actually extend to one another the possibilities that aren't just about justice? You see, mercy is bigger than justice. Justice demands a proper response to the guilt of a party. Mercy can change all of the rules. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And here's the beautiful part. Jesus, as always, is true to his word. Not only does he speak those words to the disciples in this moment, but everything about him lived this out. They had walked with him for some time. They knew that he was merciful. They knew this. And Jesus, when he was laid upon the cross... When those who drove those nails into his wrists and into his feet were right there in that moment following the orders that they had been given, Jesus prays and he says, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. Expresses in a moment of great vulnerability, a traumatic thing. It's almost impossible for us to imagine. And in that moment, he extends mercy even to those who didn't know that they needed it. This is a powerful thing, my friends. It leaves me with a question. You see, ultimately, we can look at the big picture, but it boils down to us as individuals. When Jesus spoke to his disciples that day, he was speaking to them as individuals. They were a group, but yet at the same time, there was an opportunity for them to respond personally. My question is, who do you and I need to extend mercy towards? There's a second statement that Jesus makes. And the second statement on this day is as follows. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is powerful stuff. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And once again, perhaps like I do, you ask yourself the question, do I meet this criteria? Do I even understand what pure in heart is? If the disciples were there that day, had, did they have the capacity to imagine that what Jesus was saying to them, the instruction that he was given to them, was in fact something that was possible? And I'll tell you that if you look at Scripture, you'll notice that Jesus, when he speaks, he speaks compelling words of truth that in fact describe a reality that he can imagine, that he can invite us to. And so this isn't just a pipe dream. This isn't just utopian, but this is rather something that he sincerely means to communicate. Blessed are the pure in heart. And I ask myself the question, am I pure in heart? And what do I bump into immediately? And perhaps you do too, is my humanity my sinfulness, if you want. The Bible calls it sin. The interpretation of sin is missing the mark, falling short. You and I experience this. As much as we're in need of mercy, we are also aware that that leaves us with an impression that we are clearly not pure in heart. So what are we to do about this? The root word for pure uh, gives us the word catharsis, which is the word that is used to describe sort of a resetting, a cleansing of, of emotions, of thoughts. People talk about having a cathartic moment. It sort of becomes like a relaunch of something new. This is what happens when we encounter Jesus. This is what happened to those that day who sat on that mountainside who decided to follow Jesus. They were invited to follow him, and instantly in identifying with them, they were given a new identity. They were informed that they now lived in the very presence of Jesus, and they would continue to do the work that he had started, that they would represent him, and that therefore he had a particular perspective and view of them. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples this day, he's saying, blessed are the pure in hearts, because I believe this is within your ability to experience. This isn't an elusive thing. This isn't going to be outside of your grasp, but rather this is available to you. How does it become available to us? Well, I know that I cannot know enough to have access to this incredible gift of Jesus. I cannot do enough good deeds for me to come to a place where I'm satisfied to believe. I've got this. I've achieved it. I've arrived because I've gained this purity in hearts. I absolutely have to rely on the work that Jesus is doing in my life that he is the one that can offer this, that he's the one that can in fact set me free from my wrongdoings, my sins. It requires a confession. It requires an admission that it is outside of my ability. And to rely on him and to turn to him and say, Jesus, could you do this work in my life? It requires a submission. It requires me to suspend my own will. And this is the meaning of the word heart, pure in hearts. It's not head, it's not about hands, it's about hearts. It's about the inner being. This is where our motives and our attitudes lie. This is where our will finds expression. This is where we actually engage our world with our inner core, our inner being. And Jesus says, I can touch that part of you. I can turn it around. I can give you a perspective which will allow you to see the world through a different lens and in fact experience this pure in hearts. So here's the thing. I'm trying to figure out how to do this practically as perhaps you are, and let me illustrate this to you in the following way. What does this mean to be pure in heart? The people who are pure in heart are people who finally come to a place where they recognize that really their best course of action, the best way for them to live is to simply love Jesus. To be his follower requires that, simply to love him. Now, I don't know about you, but my world is filled with distractions. I often find myself, even in the middle of moments that I am focused or want to be focused on Jesus, being distracted by the burdens of the world and the things that just really distract me. In fact, I'm experiencing double vision all the time. I don't always have this clarity of a particular perspective that allows me to focus on Jesus alone. And I'll tell you, even in my quiet time, there are moments, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit this to you, I read my Bible, and when I'm done, I close my Bible. In that very moment, as I close it, there is a part of my brain that says, check it off the to-do list. This is now done. This is behind me. 
And I've just in that moment in some ways sort of tainted the experience because it wasn't just about my focus on Jesus to learn about him, to hear words that are recorded of him and for it to shape my day. I have just turned it into an act in good of good deeds. And I don't want that. I want there to be this distracted recognition that my life is lived in such a way that my entire existence is an act of worship towards him, to love him with my entire being. And every once in a while, we can set aside time for us to focus in that way and to let the distractions go. But more often than not, I think he's the one because he desires this relationship. He invites us into this. And I experienced this not that long ago. So here's another moment where I will need your mercy. I don't know what your situation looks like in your home, but Hildy and I watch the service at home Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., as many of you have in the past and many of you are doing right now. At some point, even though a year ago when we started all of this, we sang along quite heartily and we were all about it. But over time, we have stopped singing. The two of us sit there. It's not that we're not engaged. It's not that we're not watching. It's not that we're missing out on what's being said. It's not that we're losing out on the words that appear on the screen. We're just not singing. But just a few weeks ago, the two of us were sitting there And the song started up, and I don't even know what the song was, but I found myself singing along. Now, I wasn't singing at the top of my lungs, but I was singing with some enthusiasm. And have you ever had that experience when you're in a space and you suddenly have a sense that someone's looking at you, and then you turn around, and sure enough, they're looking at you? And I turned, and Hildy's looking right at me, and she's got this huge smile on her face. And I'm a little embarrassed because, you know, I've been singing, but like, I don't, like, what's this about? And then, and, and, she, and she turns to me and she goes, this is the best. This is just the best. And we were laughing out loud and I realized I had an unguarded moment. There was nothing, there's nothing, there's no way I could defend or explain what happened in that moment. I was literally moved by the song. Suddenly, that, that's all I wanted to do, just express those words as an act towards God to say, Jesus, I believe this to be true of you. I want to say this and express this to you and say, Jesus, thank you for who you are. This was all there was, and it was an unconscious thing. It wasn't, I can't recall the physical decision in it, and it just happened, and it was a natural invitation. I've been so blessed by this moment to know that Jesus desires this kind of relationship with me. And there was a purity of heart in that moment, which so often eludes us. When Jesus speaks these words to the disciples, he's not trying to speak words of kindness to mislead them. He's speaking words of truth. And here is another piece in this particular statement. He says, blessed are the pure in hearts. What's the promise? For they will see God. Now imagine this. One of the things that defined the Hebrew nation is that unlike all of their neighbors who had very visible gods in statue forms and they built temples around them and so on, that their God was invisible. But Jesus on that day is It's very visible to the disciples. They see him in front of them, and they recognize that they are given a unique opportunity, a glimpse into the very presence of God, because here is Jesus saying, if you want to know my Father, get to know me, and you'll get it, because he's the perfect representation of God on the face of the earth. And we might say, well, see God. Well, that's nice for Jesus to say to the disciples that day, but could it be true for us? Well, the truth of the matter, again, is that the root of this word does not imply a physical seeing. It implies an encounter, an experience, a sense of the presence of God. And that, my friends, is available to us if we just make ourselves available. If we would just be willing to submit ourselves and to not be defined by our sinful nature, but rather to say, because of you, Jesus, I can experience this. I can experience the purity and heart that is required for me to catch a glimpse of you. So today, this morning, Our band that has been practicing at home and rehearsing together this week to prepare for this moment are about to lead us in sung worship. And I don't know what's possible for you, but I would invite you, I would invite you to take this moment to focus on who Jesus is and to make these next moments be about him Have him invite you into the relationship that he desires. And for you, as you stand, perhaps some of you will take the courage to kneel 
or maybe you'll take another posture. If you're somewhere in a public space right now, I apologize for the awkwardness of what you're about to do. Whatever it is that you choose to do in response, but that you would engage in a moment where you're willing to say, I will leave everything else behind. I will come to you, Jesus, and ask that you would cleanse me, that you would set me free from all the burdens that I might have, and allow me to see you. Allow me to experience you in this moment. This, my friends, is available to us because of the words that Jesus declared that day. I wish for you to catch a glimpse of him. Hi, Carly. Hi. So, lots of questions. I have several here for you. First of all, thank you. Thank you, Bob. As we wrestle with equity and inclusion and have uncomfortable conversations around these topics, the discussion about mercy is next level important. Mm. And there may have been a Freudian slip or something, but you used the word demandments today. Mm. Yes. And I'm not sure if that was a deliberately made up word. Somebody said, thank you. That's my I new favorite. I did not favorite. prepare that in advance, no. It, it kind of fits <laughs> and kind of has us think about things in, a, in kind of a creative way. Okay. How is mercy shown when justice is also needed? Are the two exclusive? They are not. Um, uh, last Sunday, uh, Paul and Laurel spoke about the, the concept of justice connected to righteousness, the expression that is there. And so there absolutely has to be justice. Our God is a God of justice. There is a, there is a recognition that there is a right of something that needs to be defended and needs to be uh, acted on. And so mercy trumps justice in ways that don't eliminate justice, but mercy becomes almost the exception, that it addresses a moment where if justice were to prevail, then that's the only thing that would happen. I'll I'll give you a very quick example. I've had several conversations in my lifetime where in the end I had to decide that what was less important for me is the rightness of something, but rather my ability to forgive, to simply say, I will release this. But my conviction about that there being a right and that there needs to be a sense of justice hasn't been removed. I insert mercy because of what God has done in my life to ask me to be merciful in moments when perhaps I am, I would be, by my own human initiative, it would be lacking. I wouldn't act on it. Okay. This next question is related to that. What is the place of truth telling and naming of toxic behaviors in the pursuit of being merciful? Uh, I think there's room for truth-telling. And the truth-telling that I think we need is the kind of truth-telling that actually will lead to a good outcome. So often I find truth-telling is used more as a weapon, it's more as a hammer, it's more like I'm going to do harm to someone or I'm going to put somebody in their right place. And there is also time for that. But if our truth-telling could be the kind that we would choose the moment, we would choose the right setting, perhaps speak it into a circumstance where the people that are hearing us declare this can in fact do something about the circumstance. Then I think there's room for truth-telling to lead to a good outcome. Truth-telling that is used recklessly and just for the purpose ultimately to do harm does not come from a, a good motive, but rather it comes from a motive to add harm as opposed to leading to a joint solution. You cannot shame or belittle people into changing their behavior. No. Okay. It is often in the heat of the moment, that moment when I need mercy the most, that is also the moment I'm least able to give it. Do you know, there's those moments when things are tight. How do you extend mercy when you really need it, but the other person certainly isn't going to give it to you? What you need is mercy upon mercy. (laughs) Because the truth is, listen, The truth is, I have offended unintentionally. I have wrecked things. Hildy has had to be merciful to me over and over again. We've been married for 36 years. Imagine the amount of mercy she's had to pour out, (laughs) right? So in the moment, I don't take mercy for granted. But because it exists, in some ways, it's... I I will be honest, I almost treat it a little bit like a get-out-of-jail-free card. But I know it's not free. I know it will cost me something. But there's something to know that because Jesus introduces mercy, it's available to us. So that means when I mess up, my best course of action is to admit my failings and to say I am in need of mercy. 
and especially when in the heat of the moment I have stepped outside of what I intended and to know that I can go and ask for mercy and be deliberate about it. There's a submission in that and the receipt of that kind of mercy is doubly rich. Okay. Yeah. And can I just set a, suggest a very practical strategy and Please. that is just a very deep, slow breath. <laughs> <laughs> That sometimes breathing in that spirit is a way of being able to say, okay, I can do something hard now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Carolyn. Yeah. My friends, it's been great to share this morning with you today. Uh, this doesn't have to be your last engagement with TMP as a community. There is available to you after 8 this evening. Go online and register. You will be sent a code for a Zoom meeting, and you can be part of a conversation that will involve any number of people from this faith community who want to be part of just checking in with one another. It's a very relational experience. It is something that I think could really encourage you, so please do tap into that. I want to remind you of two things today. One is, would you give some serious consideration to whom you and I need to extend mercy? Let's, as individuals, make sure that we introduce mercy into our life and into our surroundings. Perhaps it'll create a groundswell which will influence the bigger picture. I would love for that to be true. And the other thing is, could I invite you to consider what it means to live your life in love with Jesus so that the glimpses that we catch of him aren't just momentary glimpses, but rather they become the defining reality of our life. What would it take? What things would we need to let go? What things would we need to embrace for that to become true? That would be my blessing to you. Thank you so much for being part of this this morning. Jesus bless you.